from Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. The China Expert Series is here to educate and celebrate mistakes made by foreign investors whilst doing business in China. It includes personal stories from the China experts on the challenges they've experienced in the market, how they've overcome them, and what pieces of advice they can share with those of you who are just starting out. My name is Christina kohler Kaluccia, and I'm a Hong Kong-born European with over 20 years experience in helping foreign investors enter the China and Hong Kong market. My mission is to help foreign investors, leaders, entrepreneurs avoid the most common obstacles that they encounter along their China business journey for them to accelerate their profitability. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of our China Experts podcast. Today, I'm very happy to have Jean-Paul Schmitz on here, giving us insight into his China journey, everything from the failures to the successes, and ultimately what we are seeing in 2024 as well. So Jean-Paul, welcome to our podcast. Thank you for joining. Um, I tend to want my guests to introduce themselves because I think there's nobody who can do it better than yourself. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Thank you, Christina, for uh, inviting me to the podcast. I very much appreciate it. I'm excited to to share my my journey and my story, um, what my journey was in China over the past eight years. Um, so my name is uh, Jean-Paul. I'm from the Netherlands. My background is in e-commerce and has always been in e-commerce. I initially started in the Netherlands uh, in an e-commerce role uh, at one of the largest e-commerce retailers in the Benelux, and they are now getting into to Europe. That company is, uh, is called Cool Blue. It was a very innovative company back in 2012, 13, 15. For example, I joined the company when they did 200 million euros in revenue left the company when they did 600 million euros in revenue. So uh, extreme growth. And that company was always tied as a company that put consumers in the first place. So that company had two KPIs. One was called uh, the NPS, the Net Promoter Score. Uh, very much firm belief how good you uh, service your customers that they come back and that is actually a key driver for growth and the other kpi was of course uh, profitability there i really learned let's say the 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 tricks on how to do e-commerce but also how to do e-commerce really where you put the customer first everyone always says uh, putting the customer first uh, is but what does that what does that mean in the sense of e-commerce putting the customer first i mean what is it different from how other platforms see it now, yeah, so for example, is and, and that ex and why I explain a little bit, because that experience we really try to take with us to our China journey. Mm. And because in China, customers are very, very picky and, and uh, they ask a lot of questions. And to realize a conversion in China, you really need to do so many things in the customer journey, good. But in Europe, what you often see is a, a person puts a web shop up and uh, tries to sell their products. Um, and then it's, you know, good product description, picture and price, but there's so much behind the scenes where you really drive loyalty and in the end growth. So if you really want to grow fast and scale fast, the biggest uh, driver is word of mouth. Yeah. Because if you have a person who is a promoter of your brand and the NPS, the net promoter score really measures that. So if you only give, uh, if your customer satisfaction on a scale from one to 10, if you only give an eight, nine or a 10, then it means you are a promoter. Mm. But to give that sort of satisfaction, it's just not, you know, an ease of shopping and delivering the product, but it's really making that extra step. So when a person, for example, an elderly person is gonna go on your e-commerce shop and wants to buy a present for his or her granddaughter, just a simple handwritten card when you know you spoke to that person on the phone through customer service i'm looking for a product for my granddaughter or grandson and sending him a card saying i hope you're uh, happy with the present and i wish your uh, grandson or granddaughter a happy birthday that really goes the extra step yeah. or 
sending a, an email to that person, don't worry, uh, your product will arrive on time before the birthday. And, and that really eases people in through an online shopping experience where which is not physical, sure. which doesn't have, let's say, the human interaction. Sure. But if you can find the points where you can provide human interaction, the same with your local butcher on, 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 on the corner of your street, you go there because he gives a little bit of extra attention and, 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 and that, that eases you in, hey, I feel good in shopping here, which sure. online does not offer. So you need to find other ways. And and bringing that experience to China, yeah, that really really helped me. So so I initially started an e-commerce company that was really focused on customer satisfaction. I was for a few years there in the management of that company, and then in uh, 2016, uh, I started my China journey, and that started with selling everything I have in the Netherlands. And uh, that even I was still, what well, was my first job? So I was still living in my student apartment. And luckily someone bought the, 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 the student apartment. And I sold my bed, I sold my couch, I even sold the pillows <laughs> that I had. Just every little corn, you know, try, try, try to turn it. And I started, I moved to China in March, 2016. Why, why where did China, pop into your head how did it pop into your head so that that journey initially started uh, when i was a student so during my student time i did a, i have a degree in uh, in business administration and in the third year you could have a option to go on an exchange now and there are three regions you have europe you have the us or you have asia yeah and my logic always was the chance, and it was in 2010. So the chance of me going to the US, I thought that is much more likely of me spending a significant amount of time in Asia. And where I really always believed, and what you also read, Asia would be the the, the next frontier. It would be the future. Yeah. And so I decided I'm going to apply for um, you know, an exchange in, in Asia. Um, and then I ended up in, in South Korea, in, the, in Seoul. And I lived there almost for a year. And, and during that year, I really uh, familiarized myself with the Asian culture and their habits and just the whole vibe of daily life, the vibrance, how things are going on. And that really opened up my eyes. And in Korea, I, I didn't do business administration. I actually only took mathematics courses. When I came back to, to the Netherlands, I finished my bachelor. And then I started the master's program in econometrics. So very data driven. Because I was always tech savvy, always interested in e-commerce. And as we all know now, uh, e-commerce is extremely data driven. So yeah. I felt to get a... A, a keen grasp of business, you need to have an understanding of data yeah. um, that underlies it. And, and, and in the end, how I always call it, what I try to combine is actionable insights. Data, uh, you can analyze data, you can, you can spin data in whichever way you want. Uh, data often says, tells the truth, but you can present also data in different ways that can tell a different truth. And combining business and my mathematical background, I really developed a keen sense of actionable insight. So what does data tell me and how can I take specific actions on it, let's say to, uh, to improve the business. Yeah. So that is, um, yeah, so that is a little bit my background. But when you, when you sold all your stuff, why didn't you go back to Korea? Why China? So my co-founder of my company, he was also working uh, in Cool Blue, and he had a similar experience, but not in Korea, but in, in Hong Kong. Okay. And, and he saw, when he was in Hong Kong, he also saw a lot of Chinese consumers going to Hong Kong 
for their luxury purchases. So during, and it was almost at the same period of times when he was in Hong Kong and I was in, in South Korea and he saw, wow, well, so many Chinese consumers go to Hong Kong to buy European luxury brands. Mm -hmm. And so he came up with the initial idea, really, we need to do something with that. Mm -hmm. And and the idea started, maybe we need to buy European products and sell it to uh, Chinese consumers. And then, of course, we did several iterations on you know, on our business plan and how we want to really position ourselves. And out of that, uh, Asisys was established and we didn't want to sell products ourselves because we believe you know, how scalable is that in terms of a business model and maybe you become a small trader. Yeah. But we developed it to be a, let's say, a full service agency uh, that can offer really a turnkey solution for brands going into the Chinese market. And, and that nowadays has developed in not only e-commerce marketplaces, but we often take a triangular approach where we say you need to be on several touch points really to succeed in the Chinese market. And that is e-commerce marketplaces um, like Alibaba uh, that has Tmall or Tmall Global, uh, JD, but now nowadays you also have a flagship store on Douyin. So that's what we did, combining it with digital marketing and connecting it with B2B. Uh, B2B, online B2B or offline retail, could be cross-border or domestic. And those three touch points we had actually from day one and eight years later now, we still have that that model mm. because uh, we believe uh, connecting all those those elements really can accelerate uh, a brand in the Chinese market. And you've, so you it started in 2016, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's been now well, eight years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, everybody likes to hear war stories. So yeah. we're building, you sold all your belongings. Yeah. Moved over, starting from scratch with a co-founder. What struggles did you have building a business literally from the ground up? Yeah. Um, in China. So... I, how I went to China was just with two suitcases of clothes and that's everything I owned. But I had one thing, one advance or one thing that we fixed is we had a launching customer in hand. So while we were still in the Netherlands, we didn't have a business cards. We didn't have a website. We didn't even really had a legal entity set up, but we had an idea, a vision relevant e-commerce experience in Europe and we have been in China before um, to explore it a little bit so we had a business plan and with that business plan we just started to approach brands in the Chinese market and what we did from day one be data driven so we went to find launching customers but when we were sitting at the table with a launching customer, we knew more about what was happening to their brand and to their business in China than they often did themselves. Right. And that gives you immediately, um, you know, some kind of credibility sure. that, okay, these guys, they don't have business cards, don't have websites, but hey, they really know what is happening to our business in China. Well, they, so, you've done a lot of research, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not often that people go that in depth into looking up a customer before meeting them. Right? No, no. So when you're sitting there at the table and we were talking to quite sizable brands, so then you have the CEO, the CFO, uh, the international director, and maybe a few other people, so a board of five, six people, and you're sitting in front of them. And of course, they're interested in listening to you because, yeah, you know more about their business. It would be stupid if you would not listen to, uh, to to us. And what we did was, okay, we want to start a business in China. How do you start a business in China? First thing is probably it costs a lot of money to start something, yeah. and probably you go through a very steep learning curve, and things will take longer than you always plan them to be. So are you saying this now with hindsight or did you know that at the time? Um no, so we had at at, at the start we 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 had an advisor and he always told us 
things cost twice as much, okay. it takes twice as long than you initially think. So really prepare for that. And especially when you're a first time founder, you're building a startup and not in your home market, but in a country that is very different and, and that you are not so familiar with, especially in terms of business, because you have never done it. The, the, the chance of failure is much higher than the chance of success. So, you know, critical thinking uh, really comes into play in what are you going to do, how are you going to do it, and how will you succeed? But those things cannot, you know, work themselves out if you don't have enough time or don't enough, have don't enough cash, you know, to grow through that, through that journey. So that is, that is what we uh, uh, did. And we really bootstrapped ourselves so when we get to our first customer at the table said yeah okay we can look a little bit online on the website but how do we now understand the market so what we actually did was um through a person that we knew we were able to get access to certain data cubes uh, about the e-commerce market so when we were pitching to our first brand we knew how exactly how big their category was on team or Mm. How much, and in this case, it was a shoe brand, how many shoes they are selling and at what price and what discounts, but also what their competitors were selling. So uh, armed with that piece was of it, data. Was it difficult? Um, you said you had somebody help you get that data, but in general, I mean, do you pay for this data? Is it easily accessible to get this type of data? I mean, I'm not talking about the actual work then of analyzing it, but just simply to obtain it. Yeah. So we're talking about 10 years ago. Um, and 10 years ago, uh, Alibaba was much more open in the data mm. they, they shown you. And, and and why did Alibaba do that 10 years ago? Because uh, also with better insights in your category. And they were building up doing. their business themselves, right? So they... Exactly. So so if they give you insights and you can, through those insights, grow faster, it was also good for, yeah. for the platform. Um, most of that data was uh, also indexated, but uh, equipped with, let's say, with my background in, in mathematics, I, I try, uh, I formulated uh, some yeah uh, some rules on how to get from that index data to actual numbers okay. and that and that really helped me to 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 get that inside I remember I had a, a very old MacBook because I was still a student and thousand and in China you know there's a lot of data so many thousands and thousands of rows of data and 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 sales points and and, and sometimes my computer just completely blacked out right. because I could not handle it anymore but in the end we we got to a solid business case uh, solid understanding okay what discounts you need to do what's the seasonalities what are the trends what what are the the things you uh, can, can turn on to drive growth but one of the other things that we did was um i had a friend who was in china at that moment um, and we asked him, hey, we're going to pitch to this brand. We would like you to help us out. We would like you to buy a couple of their shoes online. And with those shoes, we want you to go to a marathon, a walking event, uh, the gym, and a few other locations. We asked the guy to get a camera. And we just did in-depth interviews with five or six people. Here's the shoe. What do you think of the shoe? This is the price. Do you like the color? Where would you buy it? Uh, and, and the guy in the gym, would you wear it in the gym? The person at the walking event, uh, would you wear that? Different types of, uh, you know, consumers, uh, uh, younger consumers, older consumers. So we did those in that interviews, made a, I think, 10, 15 minute video out of that. And with two components, data, and again, talking to consumers, which is actually my background at when I was working at the e-commerce company, a lot of data, data driven, but also customer satisfaction, yeah. talking to the consumer. And with those two components, we're sitting at the table. Um, and I think we really blew away the brand in that sense. They think, wow, these 
two guys from the Netherlands, know so much about the country, there's thousands of kilometers away, and even talk to consumers about our brand. And, and, and I think that really clicked for them. And then they said, guys, go do it. And, and the, the, the owner of the brand, uh, he was already around 70, 75, um, had a big desk on the left side of his desk. He always printed out all his emails because he didn't like to uh, answer through the computer, he just gives yeah. notes. And on the other side of his desk, there was news articles. And on top of that stack of news articles, there was in 2010 an article about Jack Ma and, and uh, about his dream uh, about Alibaba e-commerce in China. And he said, I really want to be in China and I want to be part of that. So, so he had that belief. And then when he saw two young guys um, with a vision, but also, you know, some solid information, he gave us a handshake and it was a handshake deal. And he said, go do it for us. And that was uh, towards the end of 2015. And all of a sudden, uh, March 2016, I was living in Shanghai. How did you pick that brand? I mean, why that pitch? Why, why, why that company did you pitch to? Yeah, so that is, I think, there. Is that more connections and you knew someone who knew someone or? okay? Yeah, so it's true that we knew someone and, and, you know, a little bit of luck always comes into play because it was the second brand we pitched to. The first brand was a, a suitcase brand um, from, from Germany and they were a little bit more hesitant. They thought, okay, these two Dutch guys, hmm, okay, not sure. They don't really have something yet. And, and and then the second brand we pitched to, we said, okay, maybe we need to have a brand that is in the Netherlands, you know, um, because they better understood our background. And so the company right. we work for had a very, very strong reputation. So that really, really helped us. Um, and then we knew someone and through that, we got a meeting with the CEO. So you need to be a little bit, uh, not in a bad way, but a little bit of a hustler. You sure, know, sure. like th th that first that little thing, sense. that idea, yeah, somehow left or right, you need to make it happen. But but now I'm curious, uh, that was how you pitched in 2015. How do you pitch today? How we I pitch? Mean, my assumption, assumption now is that people come to you versus you going out to try and find them. Or are you still going out to find brands? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So how we, uh, of course, we have a website. Uh, I'm doing the podcast uh, with you. People get to know us. But what we still believe is we are in the Chinese market. We see a lot of data. We know a lot of information. So we should be able to recognize trends. And we, and we should be able which brands can lift on the trend or maybe some brands that have already, you know, some awareness. Mm. Uh, or some traction with the market in China, but the brand is so far away that they don't really see what, what right. is happening. Because reality is, nowadays in China, every single brand in the world almost, you can purchase online in China. So there's always some information. So what we try to do is really be keen on what are certain trends, what do we see brands doing, that maybe are not uh, have a, a flagship store and official presence, and really engage with them and, and support it with data. Hey, we see this. How could we uh, make it work for you? Mm. So that is, that is, and of course, we get brands that come to us, and we get that many times. But then we are also very critical in saying, okay, do you have all the ingredients? Do you have all the components? to succeed in China yeah. and do you do you already know something and is your brand already doing something and sometimes that conversation leads to an outcome where it is maybe not the right time yeah. uh, the timing is maybe not right or uh, the brand doesn't have the right assortment or it is just purely that the brand itself you know internally is not set up right at the moment because what we believe is Success in China 
Of course, you need to achieve success with your partners in China. You know, the partners that you work with, if it's now, if it's your legal, is it marketing, is it e-commerce? But really the other side of the coin, and we really believe it's a 50-50 um, part of the success also really depends on the brand itself, on the stamina the brand has, the, the, the speed of innovation, um, also the internal speed of getting to the market are right. critical components for success. But I, you haven't touched on the financial component, which is always something that people ask, right? I'm assuming that the fine, having the financial resources as well to kick this off yeah. would be critical. Have you seen a change in terms of, I've never asked this question before, but now I'm, I'm interested to know your perspective on it. Have you seen a change in terms of the financial resources required in 2015 to kick up an e-commerce um, project compared to, I'm, I'm going to use 2023 because we're only in the start of 2024. Yeah. So if you want to go big in China, it, it always costs money. And, and no matter if you are going big and it takes a long time, or if you go big and, 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 and that happens very fast. At the end of the day, it it really does cost a lot of money, just because of the the sheer number of brands that are active, the size of the market, the the, the resources you need. But the question is, in that sense, is are you do you need to become a market maker? Do you need to uh, create your category, yeah. or are you lifting on a trend? And you know that and that trend and that or that category is out of itself already growing. Mm. The last one requires much less financial resources because sure. you can, you're you know, you wave. can you're floating on the wave already. Yeah, you can you can hop on a or hop on the train that's already going. Yeah, uh, it's the same thing like a a a a a uh, spaceship or a rocket you launch into space. You know, the first few minutes you burn the most fuel. Mm, sure. That is because you need to get the speed. But once you go there, you keep going. The only question is, once you keep going, uh, same like in space, one degree left, one degree right, it can significantly determine the outcome on where you land. Right. So, so, so sometimes, if you are a market maker, you need a lot of, uh, let's say, resources, financial resources, but also I think stamina, yeah. uh, patience to, to really get going. Um, but at that point still, even if you get going and you put a lot of resource behind it, the market can move away very fast from you. Right. And that is, and that, and, and, and most people who are in China uh, see it with their own eyes, you know, trends can shift in a matter of weeks. You, well, my, or let me, I'm thinking about how to phrase this. It's very rare to have a meeting with a brand who says in the meeting, kick it off. Usually there's a lot of decision-making, or at least this is why I see, there's a lot of decision-making that has to happen internally. Um, and we've also had three years of COVID and all of this. So I'm curious, from your perspective, what are you seeing in the market right now in terms of the time that brands are taking? Um, and I, I want to put this into two categories. Those that are new market entrants, what is the time that they're taking to green light a project versus somebody who's already in the market and then scaling and growing and, and, and pushing that to another level? What, what are you currently seeing? Um, in China, yeah, yeah. I think if you the the time to make a decision and especially your internal organization, align your internal organization, go through all the checks and balances before you really can greenlight something. It always takes quite a while because it is China. It is one of the biggest retail markets. Brands know if we if you really want to drive growth for your brand, no matter what stage you are in 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 in, in the life cycle of your brand, 
China really can bring a new dimension to it because just the sheer size, how substantial it is. So that that always is a longer cycle where a brand really takes six to nine months. Okay, are we internally ready? Do we have internal resources? Uh, everything lined up. That That is almost the same like 10 years ago. Yeah. But maybe 10 years ago, people instead of six to nine months, maybe they made that decision in three to four months. But that's just because they saw, hey, there's really momentum. You really need to grab this momentum. But nowadays, that takes a little bit longer. And especially of COVID, uh, what happened? People, resource allocation is really important. Do you uh, put your resources in your home market? Do you consolidate there? And do you try to build growth there? Uh, of course, nowadays, uh, we have different markets in Europe that face a, a deflation or can even be become a, get into a recession. And so the question is always, do I consolidate or do I go for new growth opportunities? But what I always like to ask, no matter which brand or at what stage a brand is, I always start a conversation is, what is success for you? And, and, and you want to do something with China, but can you define what is success for you because the definition of success can mean so many different things and different outcomes where if you want to just get a presence and and get validation from the market is there an interest in my product and and just by being present to get that and maybe some sales that is a very different route than saying i have a really innovative product yeah. Um, we are unique but we need to make the market or let's say a brand that is maybe at a stage where it's get a little bit more matured and maybe the growth is uh, slowing down uh, the initial growth very fast and it's slowing down but they want to reach a new plateau uh, that, that definition of success uh, requires a very different setup yeah. so, so that's often how I start a conversation and then based on that you really get a feeling on one how they see success but also their own reasoning their logic their thinking pattern on getting to that definition of success and and often there you can already get a feeling on okay is this are all the components right also in order to deliver that success one thing that you highlighted earlier is you, you used the word big a lot. Do you want to be big in China? Do you want to, you, you were using the word big a lot. And then it came into my mind just as you were talking then. You're right. You have to look at this. What, how does a company define their success when they are entering China or growing in China? Um, and one of them you gave was, do they just want to have a presence? Do they just want to build an image, I guess. Um, do you feel there is more, because there's this more hesitance about going into China post COVID, do you feel that there is more of this type of brands out there who are just like, I just want to step my big toe in mm -hmm. before I commit more into uh, this, just to see how the waters are and get acquainted? How are you seeing more of this as well? Um, no, less, much, much, much less. less? Because, okay. Because well, that's positive. I mean, that's a positive sign, right? That people are going gung ho. If they're going, they're going gung ho. Yeah. Because often, what, what, what nowadays, most of the categories, uh, let's say, and product categories are, are saturated. Um, and so, and there's more competition. So, brands do know let's say just being present which also requires uh, certain investments uh, is not enough anymore because uh, you can say yeah i'm sitting at the table but how much value does that still bring because right. yeah, because a lot of <laughs> nowadays a lot of companies are really concerned and and that is a good trend with their bottom line results right you know you you can spend that uh, euro or dollar only one time and and where do you get the, the best return uh, on it? So just being in the market for ju for just being there yeah, that is not good enough anymore. But that also means that getting into the market, 
requires a solid plan and 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 critical milestones on okay we put this in what we really expect to reach in this milestone and what should our next milestone bring mm -hmm. and in that sense if a how i like to see it is as a brand you would almost need to embrace the startup mentality of getting into the chinese market and that startup mentality in my opinion should always be there when you're in china you need to be flexible you need to be agile um because what i said earlier the market can move very fast in china and can also move very fast away from you yeah. so if you are let's say complacent with, with 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 where you are at the moment you very fast the market can run away from you sure. and sure. and there are numerous examples uh, uh of that in china so i mean that would be kind of one of one of the mistakes or failures right that brands make is not yeah. hitting in a timely manner but just from your experience and you can use examples from building up your own business or even what you see your your clients doing what would be the top three mistakes that companies make coming in? Yeah. So, so one of the things I think the, the, the first one is it's, it's always product market fit. So, um, and maybe it's often said, but one of the critical things is looking at product market fit, but how fast can you find product market fit? And more importantly, where do you find product market fit? Can you explain what that is exactly? There might be some people who don't know the terminology. Yeah. So in the context so, of China. Yeah, no, absolutely. So when in again, just just numbers. Uh, China, biggest retail market in the world, most consumers in the world, um, um, within a single platform, most brands active in the world. Um, so there is so much choice for consumers. If you have a brand and you want to go into the market, it's just not simply enough say, here is my product, here I am, and someone will buy it. But you really actively and very consciously need to look at who in China will buy my product. Yeah. Who is that initial customer base, uh, that critical mass yeah. that has a fit with my product without the need to push it too much. Mm. A product market fit is not like, okay, you force it onto the consumer, you okay. give a, you give a lot of discounts, you throw a lot of marketing at it, and there you find the fit uh, with your consumer. That is not product market fit. Product market fit is with relative ease, you should find a subset of the consumer uh, and at a critical mass. And it can maybe 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people, or 10,000 people. But that would relatively be easy. how niche you are, right? It's, yeah. Uh... But connect, connect with your product and connect with your brand. Because if you know you have that, then the next question is, is why do they connect with my brand with relative ease? Why do they buy my products? And that means, and then you need to get a better understanding, is it what in my product makes the consumer willing to buy it? Now, and, 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 and the reasonings for that is often 180 degrees different than the reasoning why someone buys it, let's say, in Europe. The Chinese consumer has, let's say, a different psychological buying pattern. Mm -hmm. So if you find that out, and and why buy my product but also who buys my product where are they not physically in china but where are they in the customer journey that that weaves from offline to online but where are they and then you can focus on that and then you can build out that critical yep, off of that yeah yeah and and again finding that critical mask people are promoters of your brand it gives word of mouth marketing mm -hmm. and there you can skill. And then if you put the right resources behind it, okay, th then no, then you can become and uh, build a success story in China. What are the other two? Top two. Um, 
So yeah, the other two is that is more related, let's say, to my personal journey, but I think also for brands. At some point, you find that product market fit. If it's now your brand, or in our case, let's say the the the, the full service agency that we have built. At some point, you need to scale. Hmm. And that scaling phase, I would say, is one of the most challenging phases I've experienced. But you can also see it for brands. So in for a brand, what you can see, you're being active on one platform. You may be one set of consumers, but you want to be active on different platforms. Or maybe you want to do distributors, or you want to uh, approach a different set of uh, people. Then you need to all of a sudden connect a lot of things together. It's not just one single focus but different elements and and through that scaling or you implode or or you or you, you scale or you or you scale um and in what i experienced in in my agency and that is also one of the things is when i came to china in 2016 we had a launching customer me and my co-founder setting up the business uh recruiting a team and and one of the things that I regret is that I didn't from day one really put a lot of effort in learning the Chinese language. And it's really difficult because it it is it is I speak a little bit of Chinese, but not good enough that I really can converse in the market really with a lot of logic and a lot of thinking. Not not let's say okay, just simple ordering things, but really have a challenging, you know, interactive discussion. But my my journey started, you know, two suitcases of clothes, come to China, having a hotel room, registering a company, and and registering a company required me. I remember to open the bank account, and it was many years ago, and large part I did myself was spending you know sitting in the lobby at the bank waiting for documents papers to getting chopped or getting signed sitting for hours i i think i to, just to open the corporate bank i maybe spent 40 hours in the bank and i was on a certain time pressure because we the, we had milestones with our first launching customer i wanted to achieve and having the business up and running is is critical so and then you put so much of your your attention and your energy in building your business yeah at some point you're out of energy right uh, so then you sacrifice it on other elements not, and, not even energy you don't have enough hours of the day ultimately yeah. right no exactly so so one of the things is that i missed learning chinese and that really was a challenge in scaling up hmm. because in the beginning if you're a small brand or you're a small agency, you're on top of what you do. But then I have a question. Do you not, uh, and I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, you didn't learn the language fluently. I'm assuming the co-founder, your co-founder also didn't le learn the language mm -hmm. fluently. But then didn't you have a senior management team in place that could, that you could trust to, have that language component and help you scale? No, absolutely, uh, absolutely, <laughs> and that and that is where at the point where we are today. Yeah. But but getting in getting in that journey of getting in the journey of of, of scaling it, it is it is not that uh, that you're there yet. So in the journey of scaling it, you first need to still who do I hire? How do I structure it? It often comes, and also in China, it and how do you trust them? I mean, now, it, it's, it's one about trust, but it's also about your vision. Right. And the same thing as a brand and the same thing as an agency, you want to deliver quality. And as a brand, you really want to make sure that your brand is delivered in the right way. So if you go from 10 people uh, or a 10, a 10 size brand team, you, you know, you can check in with everyone and, and you can follow. And if it's only a few channels, you can see and you can investigate. But once you scale up, you don't have that quality of attention you can really give to a detail and then if you don't master the language good enough you just get and you 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 hit a blocking point where you cannot always see is what is the quality of 
uh, as a brand or as an agency, what are we doing? And 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 through the scaling up phase, um, it slows you down a little bit. But I think this would be a very, uh, I'm not downplaying the challenge, but I think this is a very similar challenge that any brand would have going to a jurisdiction where they don't speak the language. Yeah. Uh, for example, going to Brazil and not speaking Brazilian Portuguese or going into, I don't know, I'm, I'm Vietnam and not speaking Vietnamese. I think it's a, it's a challenge that any global brand would have um, expanding. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. So I think, again, it's, it's also very similar to, to uh, why does a startup succeed? Uh, and there are three components for a startup. It is product market fit. It is the team, you know, the right team. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the right team needs to execute the right things. Yeah. And it is cash, money. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and same approach you need to have to a startup or right. a startup in China or a brand for a market fit, which I explained. But uh, the, the second thing is the team. And, and especially if you were in my experience and being in China, because I didn't master the language that good enough, I almost had to develop a sixth sense in that sense yeah. on what's happening in the market, who are the partners I'm talking to, and also and also my team and really yeah. understanding my team. And, it's and instinct type thing. Yeah. And and one way to overcome this is is to find someone who is very local to the market. So one of the things that that I learned, or may I talk about mistake, but what maybe what I would do in a little bit in a in a different aspect is to also to develop actually the growth early is really someone locally in the market who is there long time, understands the market, and really can navigate you through it. But finding those people is not easy because because. Uh, there's not so many, and then it's it's headhunting. Yeah. I mean, it's taking them out of what they are already doing. Absolutely. So you one, then you need to you almost need to pitch. You need to sell your of dream course. to them, and because yeah. they say, "Yeah, but why, why would I help you?" Yeah. Because you're you're still small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 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 the other thing is, it comes down to: Do you find a fit? You know, do you really connect on values? principles, certain ethics, and do you have the same uh, similar mindset or are you wired in the same way when you look at certain issues or business topics? But if you find that person and who is locally in the market, that they really can help you, you know, to get through that, you know, that 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 scaling, yeah, scaling yeah. phase. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think most, I mean, well, I can't speak for other people. Actually, all I can speak for is myself. I mean, I do have this right-hand person. I think without this right-hand person, local, in Shanghai, knowing everything, not you know, knowing everything is going too far, but is um, that you can trust, rely on, call at a moment's notice, I think is is critical. It's a, it's a basic foundation. Right? Yeah, and that is absolutely, and that is also... The what we as a let's say as an agency uh, in China that is the role we play also with our partners abroad. So what we often what we or what we try to call it is the value of trust. Yeah. You know, is finding the right person where you have really uh, doing business in China is already difficult enough. So you need to have a partner where you have real really trust a common understanding a common way of looking at things and really go together through yeah. through that journey right. that is what we provide to the partners we work with and for me myself as, as a as a as a founder of my business in china that is also what i look for again in yeah. the people i work with in sure. the market sure. and what's your last one um yeah, so that is so. I would say it's it's a difficult thing. It's you can develop in the market yourself. You can grow in the market yourself, um, 
And I think China is not that different as other countries, but you really, if you really want to unlock a specific market, and it doesn't even matter if you're in the Netherlands and you want to do business in Germany mm. or you're in the Netherlands and you want to do business in China, you need to have someone who holds certain keys to really get you to open up certain doors for you. And that could be maybe a Chinese mentor or a Chinese investor. But at the end of the day, people who are locally in the market uh, and, and, and grew up in that market and live there, they hold certain keys where you as an outsider, it doesn't matter the quality you deliver or uh, what you do, you will reach a certain ceiling, mm. a, a glass ceiling. You just cannot push through. And, and that has nothing to do with how, how good you are or the quality you deliver is just uh, you're not you're not there for 20, 25 years in the market uh, where you have your whole network, support system, value partners, value people. Now, you're relatively short in the market. You're still mm -hmm. figuring all that out. Yeah. And, 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 and that, 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 that time you don't have. So having someone locally in the market who knows how to navigate or to go to a certain pot that that is that is in in invaluable for you know for really growth you mentioned earlier that you had an advisor mentor before you started up the business uh, yeah. in China and now you're saying again to grow and scale having the same and an advisor a mentor somebody on the ground We're, finding an advisor who is willing to support you is not the easiest thing in the world where i mean i know it has to come through connections and things like this but um where do you start looking for somebody like that who's willing to give you time on their hands to support you advise you open these doors yeah yeah, definitely. Uh, normally, uh, it, it comes through connections. But what I really believe is, it's you will find the right advisor that has the shared vision and also the passion you have for what you're doing. He sees, he can see your passion, he can see your vision, and he can relate to that. Yeah. And I think that is intrinsically for people where they always connect. Hey, this is this is cool. Yeah. I see what the person is doing. I see what he's trying to do. I share his vision and I, I feel his energy. People want to be part of that, right? Sure. And and beca because that gives also energy back. Sure. And and I think uh, that is much more important than just your, uh, let's say, connections. But to share your passion, to share your vision, again, you need to be in the market, you know, you need to be yeah. talk, 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 meet people, and 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 uh, nine out of ten, there is no fit, yeah. and you just need to find just that one that creates <laughs> sure. a fit with you. And, sure. I think the key yeah. is making sure you continuously network, right, and get out there and meet people and see who wants to join this um, growth that you're you're trying to get. Yeah, grow. but the most, but the thing they're important is, I do believe, and that, okay, we, um, then we say something. Everyone knows we, you need to network. But you need to network with intention, you know. Mm -hmm. Just let's say if you're if you're in a foreign country and you only network with other foreigners, okay, that can yeah, bring value. You wanna network with the locals too. I mean, they're the ones who yeah. are gonna bring you the value. Yeah, absolutely. You you mentioned that you need somebody who holds the key to open doors. Just out of curiosity, what type of people are these? Are you referring to government officers? Are you referring to people within the business what what type of a of a of a profile is that now for example is um it is it, really in in the segment or the market or where you want to play or where you want to unlock something so social <laughs> uh for example doyin is is developing very fast so you see that uh and the, the biggest e-commerce marketplaces they they are some platforms are a little bit slowing down their growth or some categories are going down and you see uh, platforms like Douyin with the social commerce are growing very very rapidly and if you want to enter a new segment like that which is really different 
you can figure it out yourself again, but it more beneficial would be to find someone who is already in that ecosystem. And it could be someone who is uh, in, in the influencer network or already um, doesn't have the exact experience that you need, but it needs to be in that ecosystem. Yeah. So he can very clearly guide you through, okay, this is that ecosystem. Um, this is what is happening. Hey, these are the companies to pay attention to, or maybe this is the right person to talk to. Um, but it could same be for the retail sector. So for example, if you want to get in retail, offline retail, yeah, if you're only an e-commerce guy, yeah, yeah where, where do you start? So right. Then you need someone who can explain to you, okay, yeah, these are the retailers, this is the setup, and this is how you need to go around with buyers, merchandisers, these are the type of deals, this is what you need to bring to the table. Um, so then you go much faster again than... Sure figuring out that whole learning curve yourself. Sure. And making mistakes along the way. I think by finding these key individuals, they're sort of sharing their experience on what not to do, more importantly yeah. than what to do. Um, uh, how to avoid kind of the roadblocks and the mistakes that, that others have done in the past as well. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, I think we're almost nearing the end of, of the podcast. I think we've, we've probably just gone over a bit of an hour. Um, what are you, I mean, we're in January now, what are you seeing as some of the biggest trends for brands in 2024? So, so, and that has, so my current role, so I was always in the past of my, in my own company, uh, when I was in Shanghai, I was uh, the CEO of the business and I relocated back to the Netherlands. So that's where I am right now. Um, that has mainly do with my wife, she's Ukrainian. So it made sense for us to be in the Netherlands. My current role is uh, I'm responsible for business development, which gives me, you know, a, a unique opportunity because I talk to so many brands um, yeah. in, in, in their goals. And some brands, they or partners, they want to go into the Chinese market to realize volume. And that volume can help them to set different conditions again in their home market. And if that is now better, uh, you know, quantities that they can order, minimum order qualities or the pricing, or they can generate some skill of efficiency internally in the organization because they realize volume in China. That is that is what you see. Um, and But some brands, they say, yeah, we see new trends, new ways happening in, in the Chinese market. For example, Douyin with social commerce. We That is maybe a new opportunity for us to jump on the train. Mm -hmm. Because uh, often uh, uh, they see China's expensive and the platforms are accelerated and the big platforms are very competitive. And they see a new trend going on, which goes very fast. And relatively unknown small brands are, they see, hey, they're on that train of mm -hmm. that new trend and immediately go in the lift. So they say, hey, now for me is the time maybe to also jump on that new trend. Mm -hmm. Or, and that also goes uh, the other way. They say, I want to understand certain trends in China because if I understand that, that also makes me future proof for what potentially is coming in my home market. So mm -hmm. social commerce, uh, again, what on Douyin uh, in Europe we know is TikTok. Mm -hmm. what's happening yeah you can bet on it that these trends especially the social commerce tiktok shops those things they will come to europe right. so if you can get the learnings in the chinese market you can have an early mover advantage mm -hmm. in europe again so that those are those are the conversations and those are the things that i often see coming back in uh, in the meetings that i have Sensitive, sensitive question now. Do you still see opportunities in China? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I always believe there are the opportunities, um, but it is it, it takes more critical thinking. Mm. And I think I'm, we briefly spoke at that at the, at the beginning uh, of our conversation be, before we uh, uh, started this podcast, is that critical thinking is so crucial with all the dynamics. Uh, if it's now geopolitical, is it economical? 
just critical thinking in what is uh, the first step I take, but preferably what are the first three to four steps I take yeah. and really yeah. plan that out. I think um, that that is crucial, but you see the brands or the companies or uh, that do that, um, yeah, they still see a lot of opportunities. And do you feel like 2024 is going to be a bit of a recovery year or still, I don't know what word to use, slow, uh, not recovery. I, I like to say. Everybody's using different terminology, right? No, yeah. So there is, there is, um, of course, we know what is happening in the world. We know where things are, 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 are what, what is going on. We I, do... think, I think it's chaos globally, right? So yeah, it's chaos, uh... chaos, chaos globally. And, and, and consumers are changing their spending patterns uh, or, or businesses. Uh, if you're in the B2B field, uh, there is also a shift. Mm. But it's not that the whole economy is coming to a halt and uh, to to uh, uh, a still- where everything slows down. It just to uh, maybe like uh, the, the 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 term blue ocean. Uh, in the past, everything was a blue ocean. Everywhere was opportunities. Yeah, you now need to do just more effort to seize those opportunities. But again, that can also be a competitive advantage, right? Um, because not everyone can do that. So there is a, an entry barrier. And so when times are tough, people see there's a lot of entry barriers. But the people who push through that often also can make the biggest gains. And especially when a market is, is, switches in a, in a growth mode again, and they are the ones that, that, that uh, really seize the opportunities. Mm. So to finish off today, um, I want to finish off with the question I ask everybody, which is, Jean-Paul, when you arrived, I assume in Pudong Airport with two suitcases, yeah, um, ready to reside uh, in Shanghai, I believe it was March 2016, what would be the one piece of advice you would give yourself on that day that you arrived? The first day I arrived, find find a Chinese teacher, <laughs> and it and it and, and find was, a Chinese I, I, teacher. <laughs> yeah, and 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 because I I because that would have en- enabled me also to really again uh, a lot of pieces better uh, opportunity spotting, really really develop a much stronger much local network. Um, that, that and, and again, those things you don't fix in one day. It's an effort of years and years. You 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 need to develop. But that is when I see uh, other business men or colleagues uh, in the Chinese uh, in the Chinese market active. I think, oh wow, I think yeah, you did that right decision. Yeah. But at the end of the day, um, everything comes with a little bit of a sacrifice, right? You if you spread yourself too thin, so maybe in the end, if I look in hindsight, if I put a lot of effort in learning Chinese and maybe less effort in building the business, maybe I would not be where I am today. That that could also be a fact. Everything is a trade-off, right? Yeah. But I would I would say, because I, I like your tip, especially today, um, there are a lot of expats, foreigners who've left. I'm one of them. Jean-Paul is one of them. We're not the only ones out there. And I think year on year, there are more foreigners that are leaving China and uh, a less percentage that are replacing them. It is becoming a more localized market, if you will. Uh, Foreign companies are localizing their businesses more. And I think even if you're not relocating to China, I think it's great for anybody that is in charge of a China office, a China team, a China project to just start learning a little bit of the language. It gives you a lot of insight into the culture, um, into the the mindset, if you will, of the language. Um, uh, even when you do your business trips going over there, I think it it's a, it's a nice um, added value to have. Ultimately. Absolutely. And if and if you would ask me, JP, 
today it's uh, our March uh, March 2024 is coming up again. Um, would you go in March relocate and move back uh, to China when I was younger and a young guy and and let's say no 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 ob family obligations would you do it? I would say absolutely because I do believe there are opportunities and and there is a clear advantage to the market is you can grow really really fast uh, and 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 I definitely if I was younger I would do it again absolutely I, I I think one of the things that's key is when you say you can grow really fast it's just that you will grow faster than you will in Europe I mean you mentioned it earlier right there is a recession starting in Europe um I don't personally know if I would go to the U.S., but I I only went to the U.S. for university. I I again um, find it very difficult to acclimatize to that mindset. It's such a diff also different way of doing business. Um, I'm comfortable with Asia. I grew up in Asia, so for me, it's kind of a comfort zone. But I'm like you. I have zero regrets, zero regrets of the time that I spent there. Um, and um, to the unhappiness of my husband, I would move back tomorrow again. <laughs> it's yeah. still on my radar <laughs> moving back yeah. uh, and giving that opportunity to my children uh, to experience it uh, firsthand. So, Jean-Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to be having you back on for a whole another round of topics talking uh, probably a little bit more specific on e-commerce and trends uh, in China. Uh, so everybody do stay tuned for that. Thank you, Jean-Paul. It has been my pleasure. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast and or the YouTube channel, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. Now, can Woodburn help you? I am offering a free 30 minute call where we discuss the obstacles you are encountering on your China business journey and how perhaps we can help accelerate your success. The link to my diary is in the show notes. I look forward to speaking with you.